five. Broadcasting to you on WNN 1470 AM and TrentoVision.tv from the world's leading think tank laboratory, Barry D. In an undisclosed building in hostile territory where evil and corruption is exposed, you're about to enter the Tom Trento Show. A group that says it defends Western civilization against the onslaught of Islam. Good afternoon, everybody. It is Wednesday, October 30th, 5 o'clock in the afternoon, and you are watching and listening to TrentoVision.tv on WNN 1470 AM radio, broadcasting from Boca Raton, Florida. You can hear us from Miami all the way up to Orlando or you can listen to us on your iHeart radio app on your smartphone or other smart device. You can watch us on trentovision.tv, the teapartycommunity.com, gosh, the unitedwest.org, bare naked islam. Gosh, we're we're everywhere, everybody. There's no reason not to be listening to the Tom Trento show even when Tom Trento isn't actually here, which he isn't today. And also not here with us today is J. Mark Campbell. But who is with us today? I am CJ, and we have a very special guest in the studio today, a good friend, um, a hard-working activist, a recovering attorney. <laughs> And a Zionist conspirator, our good friend Joe Sabag is with us in the studio today. Yeah, great to be here with you guys. Yeah. Great to have some Joe. Good radio. Great to have Joe. Also, behind the scenes in the studio today, we have our producer Damon Rosen. Howdy. And we have our soon-to-be leaving the nest, Invisible Mike. Goodbye. Invisible Mike yeah, is well. soon going to be truly invisible. I'm joining the ranks of the nine to five. He's he's gonna drone it out, man. Say it ain't so. Invisible ain't so. Mike is gonna be droning it out. He's joining the corporate world. We sent him on an expedition a few weeks ago when Tom and Mark were in Israel. And we said, take the day off and go sign up for Obamacare. And uh, and that didn't work out so well. We didn't see him for how many how many days were you gone? About about a week. And he still doesn't have insurance. He still doesn't have insurance, and he says, you know what? I better go get a job, and maybe they'll give me insurance on the job, and then I won't have to figure out how to sign up on the Obamacare exchange. So he just he just gave it up. Now, actually, Kathleen Sebelius herself got on the phone uh -huh. and said. No soup for you! <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. And we are going to miss Mike, and we don't want him to go, but he will come back and visit once in a while. Obviously, so, obviously. Yeah, so you're very lucky. You get to be on one of the last shows that Invisible Mike ever did. Well, we'll, we'll wish Invisible Mike well. And uh, Mike, is there a haircut involved? No. No, <laughs> no it's not that corporate. All right. Well, <laughs> I, my father always said, if you're not going to act the part, you better look the part. So. Well, uh, he acts. He's going to have to act the part. Oh, he does. <laughs> he's the he's the champion of this office that he's going to be working in. He's worked for them before. So uh, very excited for you, and very sorry to that you won't be uh, that you. you won't be with us very much longer. Thank you, thank you. All right. I just wanted to make sure that I said that at the beginning of the show, in case we get all caught up with our stuff. And we're going to have some interesting stuff this hour because Joe is an expert on Zionism. And he's put together a very excellent presentation, which I was very um, pleased and privileged um, to attend uh, last week at um, Congregation Beth Ami here in Boca Raton. 
It is um, the six points of Zionism. So we're going to be going over that. But uh, we want to lead into it. And why, why do we need to revisit what modern Zionism is? So let's talk a little bit about how is Zionism being practiced or not being practiced? And we can see some examples of this in our own backyard. One of the things that um, Joe's been active in is he's, he's a watchdog for what's happening on the FAU campus here in Boca Raton. And uh, tell us what's happening over there. Well, we've got a lot of issues. And that's not a new conversation to the show. I mean, mm -hmm. obviously, uh, the work that Tom's been doing uh, here in Palm Beach County, of course, on the campus has really led to the exposure of a lot of what's happening. Mm -hmm. We have a situation where there's an out-of-control student group that's very clearly engaging in anti-Jewish and uh, anti-Israel messaging that mm -hmm. crosses the line into hate speech. Mm -hmm. uh, and the administration, frankly, is sitting back. They're not doing anything to in any way comment on the substance of this messaging. Mm -hmm. Everything is just uh, basically uh, hiding behind a, a First Amendment pretense and that, that's really just, uh, in moral terms, that's, that's a failure for the part of the administration. So uh, we've, we tried to make the community aware of what's been happening. Uh, and just to start from the beginning, we're talking about a student group here that uh, is called SJP, Students for Justice in mm -hmm. Palestine. Mm -hmm. What the audience needs to know is that this is a group that was started in the fall of 2000 uh, out at the University of California, Berkeley. Uh, they had a very savvy idea. They decided to take the issue of anti-Israel activism and to give it specialty treatment. They put it within a single purpose organization, SJP, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, where the point of the spear became that much sharper. The second thing that they were able to accomplish was to broaden the appeal of this agenda. There was a, a whole uh, group of students, these, these leftist students, who uh, also in, in the European tradition of anti-Semitism had very strong feelings about trying to attack Israel. And so uh, they now were able to come into the same forum and to participate along with uh, Muslim students where they otherwise wouldn't have participated, perhaps, under the umbrella of the MSA, let's mm -hmm. say. Exactly. So uh, this was very effective for them in terms of moving the agenda. Several years ago, an outside organization called AMP stepped into the picture. That's American Muslims for Palestine group. Now, this is another group that also has had a lot of issues with extremist characters and, of course, uh, transitive funding to different terror organizations. So these are all Muslim Brotherhood front groups, basically. Uh, not entirely. Uh, you know, I don't want to let some of these leftist groups off the hook either. Um, but in terms of really looking to pour fuel on the fire, yeah, mm -hmm. th this group AMP was really active in helping SJP take the next step. They helped them become further organized. They established a regional and then a national framework. Mm -hmm. And this has really led to much more significant problems on campuses around the country. We and had, South Florida is uh, no exception. We had, uh, we had a reporter, an investigative reporter on uh, earlier in the week, Lee Kaplan. And, uh, and he's been tracking um, starting from Berkeley, California, the, SJ, the activities of the SJP all around the country. Yeah. And so uh, he actually has smuggled himself into their private secret meetings and, and told us what it is that they do in these meetings, um, how they train these kids to infiltrate Jewish organizations and leftist organizations uh, with an anti-Semitic, anti-Zionist agenda. And... Um, and influence the administrations yes. of these colleges. Yes. And so now we see the trickle down from that and how it gets actuated. And um, Absolutely. Uh, there yeah, are a variety want, of groups. Uh, one, it, there's a couple of things I wanted to show you. Uh, one of them is, uh, is Damon got some good footage uh, a few weeks ago over at SJP when they were having their... Uh, Apartheid what are they, wall. Apartheid Week or something it like that? It was an Apartheid Wall. It it's an anti-Israel yeah. festival that they do every few months. There yeah, is no Israel, didn't you know? Hey, hey Zionist it's a, guy, did you know that there's no Israel? Yeah. Well, let there, this kid show you how it works. There's a geography lesson here there's for you. There's a geography you. lesson to be had. Yeah. Sure. We're just starting with the look at that. A minute ago, you just said that there should be no Israel left. 
the no, no, I think they should give it back to the Palestinians. What part? You said that this part right here should be given to the Palestinians. You said that all of these lands should be given back to the Palestinians. Yeah. Pointing and, to then, all of Israel. and then I asked you, well, what would be left of Israel? And you said, well, there's no reason for there to be anything left of this, Israel. This was Palestine before yeah. it became Israel. And here's the history. It's yeah. Great. Yeah. This was Palestine before. Where's Israel. the history? Palestine, and then Israel starts, and now it's all Israel. And this little tiny bit here is Palestine. It's like, and, how, it's like how the Native Americans out of all this land that we live on right now. Uh huh. So what should be left of Israel? Point on the map what should be left of Israel. Uh, let's see. Uh, well, no, in my opinion, this is all Palestine. Okay, all so Palestine. it's all Palestine. Should the there Israelis, be an Israel? The Israelis live on Palestinian land. Okay, the Israeli lives on yeah. Palestine. Oh. A fairness point of view would mean that there's no Israel. Is that what you're saying? Well, no, I mean, they don't have to occupy someone else's land. I just want to be there and make some Keep building settlements. Mm. So where, what part is their land? Who? Israel's. This is Palestine. Here, the whole thing. Say it again. This is Palestine. So there is no Israel. For you, Palestine. Were there Israelis? Were there Jewish people in this land before there were quote Palestinians? Were there Jewish people on those lands? I don't know. What's the history? <laughs> I'm asking you. Do you not believe that uh, Jerusalem is part of Israel? Listen, listen, because I'm looking at it from a fairness point A fairness of point of view. Yeah. So, so point on the map what should be left of Israel. I can't. The map's too small. <laughs> the map's too small, so Israel should be big. No, no, Israel... It, th no, wait, this isn't a map of Israel, though. This is a map of Palestine. That's a map, so, so there is no Israel. Not in my opinion, no. Wow. <laughs> That's quite the geography lesson. It is, it is, um, and there's a lot that I can say about what we saw there. Uh, first and foremost, the point to take away is that clearly that student was not uh, an Arab student or a Muslim student. That's right. And this is a big part of the broader point that I've tried to make to the administration recently. Mm -hmm. I had an op-ed in the South Florida Jewish Journal a couple weeks ago mm -hmm. that explains you know, they have a duty to condemn SJP's use of falsehood and use of hate speech mm -hmm. so that unsuspecting and unknowing students caught in the middle of all this don't become receptive to negative attitudes towards Israel and ultimately towards Jews. Now, right. the law is on our side in this regard. There were significant changes that happened to Title VI of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 in the fall of 2010. And basically, you know, Jewish students are now entitled to the same protections from hate and bigotry that other minority students have been receiving for the better part of the last 50 years. In the process of making that change, the uh, Office on Civil Rights for the Department of Education laid down a variety of criteria explaining that, yes, anti-Israel expression and sentiment can systematically be used in such a way to deliver a negative message about Jews. Mm -hmm. That's how we ultimately come to find students like, like this guy uh, having very strong opinions that clearly are not based on fact and are just not grounded in anything rational, but he's very passionate about it and it's probably something that he's going to carry with him for quite some time. And be pretty influential upon other students. That I mean, that woman that you could hear in the background saying, I don't know, mm -hmm. was there? That mm -hmm. woman was probably in her mid-50s. She was just someone, I don't know if she won the lottery or, or some kind of program for older people to go back to school. The woman was in her 50s. I don't know. She didn't know if there were Jews in Israel. Come on. I mean, what is being taught in these schools? And I, I mentioned this originally, Joe, just... To, to bring off a little bit, the same day I saw a professor walking by carrying not a briefcase, not a book bag, but a satchel with the big Che Guevara picture on it. Yeah. So, right. I mean, it's almost the kids don't have a prayer when, the, when their professors are anti-Israelis and then the other ones are just communists. I, my concern is less... In ter less so towards these students and, and their activities. Mm -hmm. yeah, they're, they're done for. I mean, their minds have been made up. It's not really uh, efficient or effective to waste time trying to change their minds about something. And this is a point that I make uh, quite often. Our job, our uh, obligation here is, is not to try and make friends out of our enemies. That's our job right. is to try and defeat them. The That's battle the administration's here, job. Yeah, well, the, 
the battle here is for those kids caught in the middle who are walking around and frankly couldn't give a damn about Israel, but are nevertheless being bombarded by this. They're not going to take the time to figure the facts out for themselves or to do any research. That's right. and, and so we need the administration to offer them a level of moral clarity in saying, hey, this is hate speech and just because we have to tolerate it doesn't mean that it shouldn't be condemned. This is condemnable behavior and we want all of you to know that so that you don't become receptive to the types of attitudes that they're clearly looking to sell. Well, I am wondering if the administration had any comments to make about um, the University Press, October 15th, 2013 volume. There it is. Look at this. Yeah. University Press. Free pizza, free Palestine. That sounds delicious. And the cover, student protesters organize on campus while on probation. Yeah. And, and you and have a student. Those on, the, those on the radio, it's a picture of a, of a fake checkpoint that they set up on the campus. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, and it's a five-page spread in the student. Is this the newspaper? Is this the magazine? It looks like a magazine. It's a campus magazine. It's a campus run. magazine, yeah. yeah. And uh, presumably the student activity fees pay f to have this published. I, I couldn't say. But. Which are funded by the taxpayers of the state of Florida. Co-sponsored uh, by the state of Florida. Co-sponsored by the Jewish donors who make endowments to the university. Yeah. Helps produce garbage like this. I, I sure hope not, but I, I know none of us I'm, would be I'm surprised sure if it was I'm the sure case. it does. Yeah. I'm sure it does. Yeah. Um, it wouldn't be a surprise because where would the Jewish community get their guidance on such matters? Well, they might consult, ooh, the ADL. Just a little bit squishy Well, um, look, on I, the issue. I, on, on this issue, I want to tell you that perhaps they're not as bad as on others. I do know that last week the ADL came out. They put out their annual report where they list out the top ten worst anti-Israel organizations in the country. Mm -hmm. SJP, SJP was on that was list. On the list. Uh, that was pretty amazing. I was amazed. I was it's, shocked. It's, I wonder if they'll walk it back. No, this is not the first year that they put SJP on that list. Uh, also on that list was AMP, American Muslims for Palestine. Right. Uh, you know, and there is a, a nexus between those two organizations. Okay. The really interesting thing is that, of course, as soon as they put that report out, yeah. J Street came out the next I day. I know. We spent quite a bit of time, yeah, on, it it a bit of time on that. <laughs> um, but what, what I'm saying is, looking to the ADL for guidance, the ADL is quiet the whole year long when students have eviction notices on their doors, when um, displays are set up on the campus showing um, like supposedly dead Palestinian bloody babies um, and atro supposed atrocities committed by Israeli soldiers against the Palestinian people. Yeah. All these pictures of fake apartheid walls, anti-Zionism, anti-Semitism on the campus and they're quiet all the year long. They don't confront it. I you have Hillel on campus, and, and this particular campus, uh, which has seen the worst anti-Semitism, some of the worst anti-Semitism in Florida, certainly, and they're heading towards what's going on now in California, and the head of the Hillel not only facilitated what's going on at FAU, but after he was let go from Hillel, he joined where his true colors are, and turned around and became the director for J Street in South Florida. Yeah, I, just a couple thoughts. I, you know, first, I'm generally not one for letting any of the Jewish organizations off the hook, but uh, ADL did maintain a certain level of involvement on the issue and has spoken out, and in some instances has been uh, uh, productive in that regard. Uh, the Hillel, on the other hand, is another matter entirely, mm -hmm. uh, and that really is where we have, have seen a number of the troubles, in particular after a very egregious incident last spring 
uh, the Hillel signed on to a joint statement with the administration, which we were very troubled by. It was really it was a cynical maneuver for the part of the administration in terms of trying to use the Hillel as a buffer between themselves and the outrage of the community. That's right. That's I, right. There was a really fabulous uh, documentary piece that was done by a friend of this show, Alan Bergstein, who's been on uh, right. several times. Mm -hmm. Our and man. That's yeah. So, uh, you know, he did a really great job of compiling a lot of the evidence and right. putting together an objective 15-minute piece where the viewers themselves can check out a lot of this stuff. That's right. Uh, he, it's available on the Internet. It's at exposingfau.com, uh, and that's a very easy... Easy uh, to remember. Yeah, easy to remember site. So folks yeah. can check it out for themselves, and uh, you know, this video was very helpful in terms of giving a lot of people in the community a basic understanding of... Uh, the, the who, what, and where on campus. I'll tell you who else sided with Hillel against the true Zionists who wanted to expose what's happening at FAU and expose the administration. Um, and that is the Jewish Federation in Palm Beach County. Um, I know there's more than one Jewish Federation, oh so I don't know gosh. if you want to call it South County or Boca or whatever you want to call it. Yeah. Um, those of us who were trying to expose the anti-Semitism and anti-Zionism at FAU were attacked yeah. by the Jewish Federation as instigators, extremists, and, and, and the Jewish community was warned against us for alerting the people of this area and really the whole world Can I tell of you what's something? going on on campus. Did you? Uh, you know what? It's funny you said the Jewish Federation. It's funny. Okay? Yeah. Because that same group that would like to see Jewish students at FAU intimidated. That's right. And, you know, what, the, so, the seeds of anti-Semitism being sown in front of their face. This same Jewish Federation spent what must have been a fortune putting together this incredible piece of artwork that is supposed to represent Jerusalem. It's absolutely incredible. Yeah, and Mike, if you go ahead screen? and hit net one for me and bring it up, it's this incredible piece of artwork and on the very top, on the very top is the Islamic Dome of the Rock, which is controlled by the Muslims. So they have... A, a, if you guys can't see this, go to the archives and you'll see it. It is one of the most disgusting things. And Joe, to explain to people why this is so sick. Yeah. I would say... <laughs> why does this matter? Why does this matter? It's a black eye. Uh, there's no question. Um, I, uh, having now seen that picture uh, for myself, you know, I would say that it's very problematic. We understand that there are real problems with religious it's freedom. It's so diplomatic. Oh, it's very problematic. Yeah, you think that's problematic? Yeah. <laughs> it's not optimal, is uh -huh. it? <laughs> well, hey, you know who else? I, I've seen another picture. I've seen a picture of the real one over there. Yeah. I know a couple guys that were at that same Dome of the Rock a few weeks ago. Oh, look at, looky there. Yeah. You well, know, maybe fortunate. that's where they went back. Well, they, they were fortunate to make their way up there because, frankly, if they were Jews, uh, they, they, they probably wouldn't have been allowed to go up there. And certainly if they had anything visibly Jewish uh, on them or if they engaged in any kind of Jewish prayer uh, right. you know, on, on the side of the Temple Mount, yeah, yeah, they, uh, they, they may perhaps have been arrested by the police. So, God forbid, pray with your and, lips moving. And all these things, okay, what's happening on the campuses, what's happening with the Hillel, What's happening with the Jewish federations? What's happening with the Jewish civil rights organizations in this country? How are all of these institutions failing us? What is the solution? The solution is we need to take another look at what real Zionism is. How do we practice it? How do we get the information out? What is the program for that? And that's going to be what changes people's minds. We have to alert people to really listen what's going on. Pay attention to what's going on and then when they go like this and say, oh my gosh, what am I going to do about it? You've got a plan. So let's talk about that, the six points of modern Zionism. Yeah. Well, I actually want to go ahead and do a station ID real quick. Oh, I was going to say we that. We haven't done that. Real, just okay, I was looking. Yeah, I was going to interrupt. Okay, station ID is, it is 25 minutes past the hour on Wednesday, October 30th. And you're listening to TrentoVision.tv on WNN 1470 AM. We are 
pleased to have as our guest this afternoon Joe Sabag, who's a Zionist conspirator, and he is laying out his Zionism program and for us today. And recovering attorney. And recovering <laughs> attorney. Um, and uh, and we, ha we have some really good pictures and good videos on this show, and I hope if you're listening in the car while you're driving or you're listening at work that you'll visit us at the archives at um, youtube.com slash the United West. And, and check out today's show and, and see what you missed if you were only listening. How's that? Cool. Okay. Let's get you. on with it. Now, moving right along. Now, just let's preface this with, um, this is um, something that you and Tom actually went and saw at Beth on Me. Yeah, we did. Last yeah. week, and Tom told me on the way up to Daytona Friday that w it was outstanding. Yeah. And so when I found out that uh, we were going to not have Tom today, <laughs> um, I was not fortunate enough to go see it live, so I said, you know, let's have him do it right here for everyone. That's right. So Joe is going to go over the six principles of modern Zionism for us. And for those listening, if you, if you can, you might actually just want to jot these six things down. They're very simple. And, uh, you know, it's a, something you could think about. If not, just check it out on the archives. But this is very important, whether you're Jewish or not. It has nothing to do with this. Hit it. Absolutely. So uh, let me just say for starters, there's a real problem with the word itself, Zionism. Mm -hmm. Most people, even folks who would say, I'm a Zionist, don't really have a fundamental understanding of what this word means. Well, what is the mission? What are the values that are attached? What are the priorities of this? Mm -hmm. Zionism is a program of action. Uh, this is really... Uh, so even though we're having a theoretical conversation, I would say ultimately that Zionism is about taking action. Uh, you know, the first point of, of modern Zionism is the way that I define it in theory, and, and I spend a lot of time writing about these matters, is that Zionism is a spiritual matter. Okay. Uh, and I argue that there really is no such thing as secular Zionism. Now, I don't mean to say that Zionism is attached to any level of observance or uh, necessarily religiosity. That's not the case. Okay. You have many secular people who are nevertheless Zionism, the Zionists. Right. The point is, is that when a person feels this attachment towards Israel, if they stand up for Israel, especially in the face of some kind of opposition, mm -hmm. when they get off a plane, as, as, uh, as Tom recently did in Israel, mm -hmm. and they feel a part of something bigger than themselves, I'm sure they think of their forebears, you know, our Jewish friends think of the patriarchs and perhaps their ancestors. Our Christian friends, of course, think about the fact that Jesus was born and lived his life there in that area. Mm -hmm. They feel a spiritual sense of attachment to it. Okay. And that's why I say that Zionism is a spiritual matter. Okay. Okay. okay um, so you don't have to be uh, an Orthodox no, uh, you don't even have Jewish, to be Jewish person or... or um, Tom or is a, a practice Christian. or a practicing Christian. Um, Correct. Tom is a Christian Zionist, as I would define it. Uh, Absolutely. But the point is, is that he finds a, a deep sense of spiritual attachment and meaning in his connection to. And it's really uh, not Israel. just Christians and Jews either, because it's. Uh, it's the, the Muslim Hindu. love Jerusalem too. In fact, we like to call the uh, Al Quds and make it our very own. <laughs> I forgot to tell you, Joe, that uh, Imam Abdullah is also with us in the studio today. I didn't see him he walk might the be, door. yeah, he might be piping in every yes, now and, Lord and Joseph, then. Joseph, I hate you very much, my friend. <laughs> yeah, he really, really, really doesn't like Zionists. Don't shoot. He really doesn't like <laughs> Zionists. But um, I think the largest, uh, I, I think, uh, what is it, the Baha'is? The Baha'is? Baha'is. Yeah, yeah. They have uh, like the largest temple is in Israel. Really? Yeah. I the largest not know temple that. outside of India or something like that is I've seen an incredible in Baha'i temple uh, outside of Chicago. Yeah. <laughs> I think the CJ is perhaps referring to the uh, 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 the site in, in Haifa, isn't that uh, that's the Baha'i temple? I'm there. trying to I'm trying to think of it. It it just popped into my head and I shouldn't have said anything about it if I didn't have it on my screen. So so don't even listen to me. Um, but but it, Israel is a spiritual place sure, um, absolutely. for a lot of people. Absolutely. Um, and not for the Muslims. Yes, for Muslims. So the second principle uh, is, uh, is the fact that the preservation of Jewish life is really uh, the highest priority and value of Zionism. In fact, that's really the essence of what uh, motivated uh, the folks who founded modern Zionism. Um, 
It's not chauvinistic, though. No, it's not chauvinistic. Um, but if we're all supposed to be um, equal and uh, repair the world and everything else and get along with everybody, then how does trumping Jewish life over everything else make any kind of egalitarian sense? Well, See, this you're is speaking the leftist, towards the third principle now. This, which, is, this is the leftist Jewish argument uh, against... You know, we're going we're to come back to that because the third principle okay. is, in fact, you know, the fact that Israel's Jewish character is paramount amongst all of its characteristics. Okay, so I skipped ahead. Um, I, I, just to speak briefly towards uh, principle number two okay. uh, for a moment. Preservation of Jewish life. Yeah. Now, this, unfortunately, is a realization that took far too long to come about within the Jewish world. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, even once the concept itself had begun to be forwarded, it still took another 50 years and the disaster of the Holocaust for people to really appreciate this fact. And this was really the driving factor that finally led, uh, you know, the, uh, the Israelis to push out the British and end the mandate and decide to stand on their own two feet and have their own sovereign country. Mm -hmm. uh, but... In general, you know, this is not just a Zionist value, of course, this is a reiteration of a supreme uh, biblical value, you know, that uh, the preservation of life is really something that uh, itself uh, supersedes all else. Hmm. Can, I, can I ask you a question? Sure, about absolutely. This? Okay. Um, the early Zionists, yes. or the mid century, mid, mid 20th century Zionists, um, uh, the Holocaust was obviously very important to them as, as the reason for needing a modern state of Israel. Um, for uh, we saw in the Pew poll that came out a few weeks ago about American Jewish attitudes yes. that um, American Jews seem to think that it's because of the Holocaust that we need Israel. Yeah. Okay, so they're not really getting that number two on your list. Um, the early Israelis were very secular. And how, how do you balance the, the secular aspect of Jewish life with the preservation of Jewish life? If, if the society is so secular, what are you preserving when you say that you're preserving Jewish life? Secular Zionism died 20 years ago uh, with the Oslo <clears throat> Accords when they were signed there on the, on the lawn of the White House. Uh, there is no longer such thing as secular Zionism. What folks would describe as secular Zionism really is nationalism. And there is such thing as Israeli okay. nationalism. But again, I, I often make the point that not all brands of support for Israel are uh, necessarily of the same value. Okay. Um, and, you know, that's a, a very key uh, distinction to keep in mind. Okay. Yes, it's true that the initial framers of Zionism at the very end of the 19th century were largely seculars. Theodore Herzl, uh, Max Nordau, and others and this, you know, unfortunately even led them to considering certain bad ideas. For example, perhaps establishing the Jewish state and homeland in Uganda versus We're doing so. <laughs> versus doing so in, uh, you know, in, in the land of Israel, which, mm -hmm. you know, we understand that this also you know, explains that Zionism is about more than just, you know, safely securing the Jewish people. And, mm -hmm. you know, this is how we transition into the third point. It's the fact that, you know, Zionism is about allowing all of Israel's cultural facets to uh, flourish. Uh, that's why it was necessary to establish the Jewish homeland in the land of Israel itself. So, you know, in, uh, it's about the preservation of, you know, the Jewish religion, Jewish culture, uh, Jewish identity. Mm -hmm. And this is something that, unfortunately, a lot of folks have uh, become quite distant uh, from here in the United States. Look, this is a wonderful country. It's a very comfortable place to be, and perhaps Jews don't suffer uh, in the way that they did previously from, uh, you know, especially, you know, violent uh, attacks of anti-Semitism. Right. I mean, know, compared to Europe. I mean, never mind the Middle East. I mean, just even compared to Europe. Yeah, absolutely. It's a, it's a huge difference here. Sure. And, and the country itself is a melting pot, and so there's a force of assimilation that gradually over time, and we're now really at the fourth generation since large-scale immigration of Jewish persons to America took place. And so, mm -hmm. in, in general, they've now lost a certain attachment to Jewish identity. And, you know, that also corresponds to a loss of attachment uh, toward Israel. Um, 
so Zionism in that regard really is a remedy to a lot of the troubles that people are now sensitive to after reading that Pew polling. Right, so. right. I mean, uh, it, it seemed like a, a majority, particularly um, amongst uh, the reform, the reform Jews in America, yeah. um, did not believe that um, Israel belongs to the Jewish people because because it's in the Torah. The Torah it's a, says so. Um, it's a, a very it's problematic. Like it doesn't exist for them. It's a very problematic thing. You know, the Reform movement in particular. Uh, at least from my perspective, really uh, bears a lot of concern. Yeah. A lot of folks who attend reform synagogues are not aware of the fact that the reform movement has its own political action committee uh, called the Religious Action Center. So uh -huh. you know, I often urge people who are members of reform synagogues to take the time, look up the Religious Action Center, and then take a look at their platform. And you're going to see that they're taking positions primarily on uh, social issues and in fact their agenda is almost an identical copy of you know the agenda of the left wing of the democratic party so is there any not other wing exactly. yeah i was going to say is there, exactly. a, is there any other wing of the democratic party now <laughs> i don't think so the religious uh, action network is that what it's uh, called RAC, Religious R -A Action Committee. Committee. And so, I, listen, you know, folks can do what they want in their lives. They can decide what's right for them. Mm -hmm. But I do think that they need to make informed choices. And I've often encountered a lot of folks who attend reform synagogues but are unaware of where a portion of that, the dues that they're paying on an annual basis are being spent. Right. And they may or may not want to be a part of those values and that kind of an agenda. Um, but in looking at the platform itself, they'll understand what they're, what they're a part of. Um, right. Now... It's a lot of these folks for whom being Jewish is very much tied into uh, uh, an issue of, of social activism and social justice and mm -hmm. so on. Um, in it my sounds opinion, a lot like, like the federations to me. Yeah, to a large extent, the federation yeah. is driven by folks who are part of this perspective. Yeah. And, you know, so what we're here, you know, a lot of the dialogue coming from that part of the community tries to claim that Israel can't be both Jewish and democratic, especially with regard to Israel's treatment of, of What's nonsense. What's that? All the Jews are Democrats. <laughs> In King's Point, 99% also, I would like to, they vote uh, Democrat. I would like to introduce to you another guest uh, visitor who we frequently have in the studio, Schmucky Putznik from King's Point, Delray. <laughs> Meet Delray Joseph. Delray Beach. <laughs> Welcome. How are you? Although it's not on the beach. Hello, <laughs> Joseph. How are you? How are you? <laughs> So you're, uh, you like Israel, but you're not a Democrat? No, uh, I, I'm an independent. I'm I a thought thinker. that the Democrats liked Israel and the Republicans hated Israel and the Jews. <laughs> Is that true? Uh, well. No. <laughs> it's not. It's not. What has so Debbie Wasserman Schultz been telling me for years? She says the Republicans kill the Jews in Israel. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Well, yeah, yeah, she if, does, if yeah. you listen to her. <laughs> All right. Um, well, we don't have to get too much into American politics because no. really we want to talk about something even worse, which is Jewish politics. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's uh, also known as uh, what, making hot dogs. Oh my that's, gosh, uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Sausage. Sausages. Yeah. <laughs> uh, kosher sausages. Yeah. Uh, Israel's Jewish identity is paramount among yeah. its characteristics. Yeah, so I was going to transition to this point yeah. and say that, you know, a lot of the folks that we've just described, folks who are very active in, uh, you know, uh, uh, social justice and, 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 and political social issues, mm -hmm. you know, they're trying to claim that if Israel does not uh, basically carve out its own guts and hand over, you know, a massive chunk of territory to uh, Arab enemies who will turn it into an Iranian proxy state committed to Israel's destruction, that Israel is in danger, that Israel can't be both democratic and Jewish. Uh, a couple thoughts on this. First of all, it's complete nonsense. Of it doesn't, course it's it, nonsense. It, it doesn't hold up. Now they're going to say, well, you know, there's a million or so Arabs living in Judea and Samaria and, you know, logically their birth rate, so on and so forth. Uh, first of all, you know, there's, uh, there's liars, there's damn liars, and then there's statisticians. As, uh, <laughs> I thought you were going to say lawyers. Yeah. Liars, liars, <laughs> and lawyers. <laughs> <laughs> you know, look, uh, the point being is that, you know, they've cooked up a lot of numbers trying to uh, claim that uh, that Israel can't survive the this. The demography so bomb. Yeah, the, the demographic yeah. uh, Which threat. is a complete hoax. Yeah. I, you know, uh, 
there's a really great person who does a lot of work on this. That's uh, former Israeli ambassador Yoram Ettinger. Yeah. And he writes the, the Ettinger Report, and mm -hmm. that's a great place where if people really want to see somebody take on the the uh, the data and mm -hmm. you know empirically debunk this whole myth of the demographic threat. Um, mm -hmm. And what's that website? I'm sorry. Uh, it's the Ettinger Report. They can Google the it. Ettinger I don't know what the yeah. uh, what the website is offhand. Uh, you know the, uh, the the second thing is that. If we stop and we consider these million or so Arabs living in, in Judea and Samaria, or the West Bank, as, mm -hmm. uh, as, as they commonly refer to it, which, you know, by the way, they, they call it the West Bank for the, the sake Bank. of not having to suggest that Jews have no right to live in a place called Judea. Judea, <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, but the, the suggestion is made that you know, these are uh, uh, you know, victims and refugees and that Israel is responsible for reconciling their situation. Right. Are they refugees? Are they victims? No. Yeah. Well, no, but well, even, they're they're victims of their own are, fascist government, uh, the, PLO leaders and Hamas leaders is what they're victims of. Correct, and even beyond that, they are victims of the cruelty of their own Arab brothers and sisters. Yes, okay. yes. Um, that's the reason why they're still suffering. That's the reason why they're refugees, and and uh, you know, if it, they are. Uh, well, so uh, you know, from the perspective of persons like myself. It's not incumbent upon Israel to have to resolve this situation. Israel didn't create the problem, and the resolution for the political and national aspirations of these Arabs lies outside of Israel's borders. There are 22 Arab Islamic countries, mm -hmm. uh, you know, who can uh, resolve their uh, who can resolve their issues. In fact, there's a country right across the border. It's called Jordan, it's called isn't Jordan. it? Yes, and Transjordan. Uh, you know, well, it was previously Transjordan, and what we understand is that, uh, you know, the territory was split in 1922 by the British, and they decided to create one Jewish state and one Arab state. Eighty percent of the territory was given towards the Arab state, mm -hmm. and then they allowed a usurper to come in, uh, in which is the, uh, the Hashemites, and of course, they set up shop. Jordan is a country with an 85 percent majority of Arabs who identify with the same ethnic bloc as the so-called Palestinians, mm -hmm. but who are ruled by a minority faction uh, that uh, that controls the country. Oh, is that, that kind of like apartheid? It's <laughs> kind of like, uh, <laughs> kind of sounds like a lot like Syria. Oh, to an extent. I, but what it's exactly like is mm -hmm. a two-state solution. Now, if it didn't work, we then, already had a two-state solution. And how well did it work out? I mean, well, only... it worked fine as long as all the Arab states weren't attacking Israel and losing their wars. Right. Well. Uh, the point is, uh, exactly. <laughs> Those exactly pesky like Jews explain. kept Those defending pes themselves. Those pesky <laughs> Jews, you know, decided that they were there to stay and, and to have their own homeland. And, you know, uh, the creation of, uh, of a Palestinian state didn't satisfy the desire to destroy Israel. So. Well, that's because the desire is not for the land. The desire is for the extermination and eradication of all Jews. That's right. Not only in the Middle East, but folks, let's face it. They want to see it everywhere in the world. That's right. The, the issue is Israel's existence. It's, this has nothing to do with territory, and it has nothing to do with the, with uh, with sovereignty. Therefore, failed Oslo. Yeah, absolutely. So Oslo was was destined to fail even before. Uh, they're you know, still even, even touting it. it. Got off the ground. Well, uh, of course they're still touting they're it. They're still touting it. Well, uh, because, they trot it out. Uh, but these are extremists. We have to understand that that you know the true extremists. Uh, in this situation are the folks who are continuing to uh, try and, and, and beat this dead horse called the, the majority in this Land for peace. The majority. They give land, they give us peace. Is that right, Joe? Well, uh, you know, land for pieces of Israel. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. Um, land, I, I don't understand. I land think that the majority, working? No. the majority in this country, um, the liberal Jews. Yeah. Okay, and that's the majority of Jewish people in this country are liberals. Um, they believe still in Oslo. Yeah, I would say, I, I don't know if that's necessarily true. For example, in 2011, there was a public survey done by the American Jewish Committee, the AJC, which showed that 55% of American Jews now oppose the creation of a Palestinian Arab state. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I, I... Did anybody tell the leaders of the so-called Jewish organizations in this country that that's the new line? Well, even if because they have, they've cared. 
because that's not what you hear from the people who set themselves up as the leadership and the spokesmen for the Jewish people in this country. They are for Oslo. They control the organizations in this country yeah. that we contribute our funds to, yeah. thinking that they're doing something good for the Jewish people and for Israel, and they're working against us. Look, uh, shame on them, but I would also say, you know, shame on all of these unsuspecting Jewish people who just open up their pocketbooks without asking critical questions about what's being advocated and how that money's being spent. So, Like a J Street or a Jewish Voices for Peace? I mean, yeah. you, you take an organization that says Jewish Voices for Peace. You want on to tell the surface, me? On the surface, that sounds fantastic. Yeah. There couldn't be a more anti-Zionist pseudo-Jewish group around other than maybe J Street, which is... You know, yeah. certainly doesn't Tell have... me why this is so prominent on a piece of artwork in front of the Jewish Federation. Well, that I've... just tells you everything you need to know right there. I would agree. When we say when we say Oslo is failed, what does that mean? What does that lead us to? Peace not comes not from land not... for peace. What does it come from? That's right. Peace does not come from appeasement. Peace comes from strength. And that's the fifth point uh, that I make. Um, really, you know, we have to begin to pursue policies that are predicated on this principle. You know, peace through strength as it was framed by peace Reagan. Peace through strength, not appeasement. Correct. Uh, you know, and even the phrase peace through strength is a reiteration of a very famous Zionist phrase, which was, we must build an iron wall. You know, these were the words that were preached by Jabotinsky who essentially basically just said, look, we need to show our enemies that we are here to stay, and we need to be determined in order to enforce our rights and, uh, and, and to maintain our safety, and you know, that will become an iron wall, and once they realize it's impenetrable, they'll give up and they'll normalize with the fact that we're here to stay. Okay. So, you know, uh, now, uh, some folks are going to want to misconstrue this and, uh, you know, suggest like this that, guy? Yeah. <laughs> Well, I, you know, <laughs> radio audience, it's Tom Trento sitting on a Merck of a four tank in Israel last night. Well, let month. me let me recap the points uh, sure. that we did so far. Um, Zionism is a spiritual matter. Yeah. The preservation of Jewish life is the highest priority. The of highest Zionism. priority of Zionism. Um, Israel's Jewish identity is paramount among its characteristics. Yes. Uh, in other words, it is and always will be the Jewish state of Israel. Correct. Okay. And then we have, how do we make that happen? Peace comes through strength, not appeasement. Appeasement fails. Appeasement does not work. Correct. You get, more, you get hit more, 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 more. The more you give away, the more you bend over, the more you get hit. You know, you, you cannot make peace with people who want to um, exterminate you. Absolutely. Your responsibility is not to try and satisfy them and, and make friends out of I them. I love that Your quote responsibility that is to defeat them. You know, that's, yeah. that's, Strong that's, that's really the case. Yeah. Uh, you know, and so I explain often that you know, peace describes the outcome that we're ultimately hoping for. Right. It certainly doesn't describe the, the process of getting It's there. not a tactic. Peace right. is not a tactic. Correct. To achieve right. peace. Yeah. Right. Uh, you know, <laughs> right? It, <laughs> sadly, but it's not. Well, one of my favorite quotes that you gave um, that I wrote down um, during your presentation last week is, Zion the Zionist movement must not look to make friends of its enemies. This That's is right. something, um, not, not just a problem in Israel, a problem in this country. We're so squishy yeah. as Jews. We, we just want to be loved by everybody. We don't want to be hated. Um, and, and so we look to accommodate and accommodate and, ex and excuse and explain away yeah. um, really reckless, dangerous behavior of others. We make excuses. It's amazing. It's, it's that, that, that is so well put. That might be the biggest single problem right there. I, you know, a lot of folks would say that that mentality is reflected in the current uh, diplomatic posturing of, 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 of the American government. That certainly hasn't always been the case. You know, I point out that uh, 75 years ago, we faced an existential threat coming uh, uh, towards us during World War II. You know, the, uh, the Axis powers had it out for us. There's no question about it. And so we didn't have much problem in exercising the self-respect self and, and the moral clarity 
to go ahead and to enforce the policy, the policy of speak, uh, peace through strength. You know, the point being is that we did what we had to in Dresden and in Hamburg mm -hmm. and Nagasaki mm -hmm. and Hiroshima. And, you know, ultimately we forced our enemies to realize that they needed to surrender unconditionally. And once that happened, they would have to normalize themselves with the situation that we came in and imposed. The United States is here. In the same way that Israel needs to have a heavy hand with, uh, with Hamas and, and other terrorist entities. Mm -hmm. you know, and then ultimately to allow these folks to normalize themselves with the fact that Israel is here. Israel is going to defend itself. That terrorism will be met with harsh punishment. And that the law itself um, you know, will be explain enforced. That. Yeah. Explain that. Explain how um, the rule of law works. I, I, I'm, I just want to say one last thing before we okay. transition to that point. Peace through strength does not mean that Israel has to be abusive or unconcerned with innocent people who are caught in the middle of all this. You know, is Israel concerned about poor Arab children who are being used as human shields by Hamas and other terrorist organizations? Right. Absolutely. More so than Hamas is. More, Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, they, they put every, any time there's a squirmish, yeah. um, uh, uh, whether it's a war or not, um, the Israelis warn. Yeah. Everybody, phone calls, listen, yeah. we're coming. From the air. Emails, phone calls, tweets, um, air right. raid sirens for you to let you know that we're coming. Unheard they go of. out of their way um, as as military fighters not to injure civilians, yeah. even when they know that they're going to take more casualties on their own side. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're recalling. If you look at the hospitals. Yeah. The hospitals, Mosques, the schools, hospitals treat, yeah. they treat the sure casualties. They yeah. You know, there was a famous quote from a British, uh, uh, a British military officer who pointed out that, in fact, in the history of warfare, no country has ever gone to greater lengths to be more humane in confronting an enemy uh, than Israel has. Okay. I, you know, so just, you know, uh, getting back to the point, is Israel concerned about these unfortunate uh, uh, innocents who are caught in the middle of this, you know, absolutely. And Israel's going to continue looking to minimize their suffering. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, should that in any way stop Israel from doing what it needs to do to dismantle terror and to protect its own citizens first and foremost? Not absolutely for a single second. Not, not for a single absolutely second. Absolutely not. Well put. Yeah. Okay. Um, you know, so, you know, getting back to the issue of rule of law, you know, yeah. there must be rule of law. And this is the sixth principle. And we're about to have a very significant demonstration of this in the coming days. You know, yeah. as a lot of folks are aware, the Israeli uh, ministerial cabinet just yeah, voted here on Number Sunday. Here, um, they just voted on Sunday to engage in a second terrorist release, which, of course, is happening because of significant pressure being placed on the Israeli government by the United States. John Kerry and President Obama have done a lot to try and uh, place undue duress upon Israel, and, and this really is Israel giving into that stress. Yeah, you people out there, this administration, this president is not the best friend Israel ever had. What? Yeah. yeah. That's what all the commercials told me. Uh, he just he just dropped his white fish sandwich on the floor. I did. I was uh, all the commercials. They told me that. Oh, this country's never had a friend like Obama. Israel has never had a friend like Obama. I just Are read. You, you're kidding me, right? I just read the other day that Obama is returning looted Jewish artifacts to the yeah. governor, uh, the government of Iraq. Uh, you know, in Baghdad. Uh, my. Uh, okay. Why don't we just give back to Germany everything that the Nazis stole from the six million people, the six million Jews they slaughtered? Why don't I, we just I collect that all that up and send it back to Germany? I hope that there's something that can be done about that. Um, you know, uh, in terms of the rule of law, mm -hmm. you know, the release of prisoners here, especially mass murderers like we're about to see, mm -hmm. in fact, that's going to be... It's, I have a feeling that it's happening uh, now as we're it speaking, as a matter is, of fact, yeah. um, you know, uh, if it hasn't already happened. The point is, if you want to see, you know, the breakdown of the rule of law, you don't have to look any further than what's happened with the release of these mass murders. What is the expectation of people who engage, of these Arabs who engage in criminal behavior against Israel? Yeah, we to see do children. it again. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, of you course. Know, we see Their families are going to get taken care of. Their That's families right. get... Uh, 
government and 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 United States tax dollars. U.S. Paying, tax dollar subsidy. Pay, paying That's, Palestinian okay. terrorist families. Absolutely. That's right. Ab um, absolutely. They get their money. They get money from the Israeli government, like walking walking money. They get treated like royalty That's in prison. That's right. They're going to have you know full rights enforced by the International Red Cross. They're going to have visitation rights from their family. They can commit these horrible acts of mass murder and be guaranteed that Israel won't enforce capital punishment and the death penalty against them. Right. I mean, that's, that's wild. As we said, you know, subsidies that are going to come to their families from American taxpayer monies. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, if they've killed enough Jews, they'll be glorified in their communities. Perhaps right. they'll have children's sports teams named after oh, them. They'll have streets named after them yes. and monuments erected in Street their honor. Street signs, parks. Yeah. Absolutely. And what matters most is the fact that it's reasonable for them to expect that at some point in the future they'll be released from jail before justice has been fully served on them. There, there is no justice that can ever be served in, in, in the here and now on these people. Absolutely. Uh, I, I don't care. You can lock them up for the rest of their lives. You could kill them tomorrow yeah. and it's still not justice. Well, you so know, the idea that they're sitting waiting for the next Israeli soldier to be kidnapped or for the next time peace negotiations get started right. up and the American president's going to come calling, yeah. you know, their expectation is that sooner rather than later they're going to be sprung free from that situation. That's right. And, and that's really, that's where we see a breakdown in terms of, you know, law and justice and what gives uh, an order to society. It's the expectation that crime will be duly punished that deters people from engaging in this type of violent criminal behavior. So, in other words, people are responsible for themselves. Yeah, um, you know, and that's, uh, that's the final to, point yeah, that we're going to look to make here. Yeah, let's go to the final here. point. we got a couple it's, of minutes. It's the point of individual responsibility. Okay. The state of Israel was established for the Jewish people to take responsibility for their own well-being, mm -hmm. their own security into their own hands, understanding that it had been a failure in all those centuries that we had been reliant upon others for our security and our well-being. Okay. And, of course, personal responsibility is that's. You know, that's something that starts with us on the personal level. Okay. I'm certain that's something that the listening audience of this show fully understands. Right. It's the point that, you know, we ourselves, you know, we, we have to be committed to trying to make a difference. What may seem like a small act, in fact, over time can grow into a big act. A group of individual people deciding that they want to make a change mm -hmm. do have the ability to ultimately uh, have an impact. There is nothing that can be done, you know, uh, with, with the right intent that is that is worthless, and so you know we have to stop and constantly look for strategies for for making a difference. Which I guess that's uh, a conversation. So those for another of us, day. well, no, those of us. Uh, I I want to end with this because those of us here in the United States, yeah. when we when we sit here and we're talking about this, and we made it very local today. Yeah. Um, we made we we put it around Boca Raton and Palm Beach County well, we started and that FAU. Way, then we went all the way to Israel. Uh, uh, we went to Israel, but but let's bring it back because okay. personal responsibility. There isn't anything that we've talked about that Joe hasn't laid out in the show today that every individual who is listening to this show can't start practicing on his or her own. Absolutely. So, you know, I'll even go ahead and, and offer a few uh, material suggestions for what folks can do. Okay. Okay. First of all, you know, they need to become involved. And the best way to do that is by becoming educated. If you want to be an advocate, an effective advocate, you have to have a control over the facts and data. Okay. And so a really good place for them to get started would be by checking out the, uh, the Myths and Facts website. That's mythsandfacts.org. Okay. On the left side of that page is a little button that says the conflict. If they want, you know, facts and data that are all substantiated, they can go there and they'll have an okay. excellent primer on, you know, uh, Israel's situation and what Spell it's facing. Again? Myths and facts. Myths and facts. Yeah. Myths on the left and facts.org. I got one of their little booklets. Fantastic. Yeah, I, mean, I this, keep it in my, ba in my work bag. This is the book that every person who cares about Israel should own. It's, okay. it's the single most important book that I have. Okay. The second thing that folks can do. They have to begin to make a principle of buying Israeli products. Yeah. Okay. And so, you know, a lot okay. of folks, if you're doing something at the church, if you're having a Shabbat dinner at your home, mm -hmm. as a matter of principle, make sure that there's an Israeli product on the table. Israel is being attacked by more than just guns and, and rockets. They're using law. They're using the, you know, economic warfare. We have to do things, small things that support the Israeli economy. Okay. And, we have and to your make third a, big a, a thing. Principle. So myths and facts. Buy Israeli products, and what's your big number three? 
You have to be vocal. You cannot sit back and be silent. Okay. You have to send out emails. This show does everything you know that, that an activist needs in terms of giving them facts and information, letting them know what issues are hot. I would suggest that folks continue to check in on this show, watch it, listen to the marching orders that CJ and Tom are sharing there. They're going to let you know what issues need to be worked and how to get involved. And we're going to bring you back. <laughs> <laughs> we, need, we need more no, Joe's no, up. Bring yeah, back. Yeah, yeah, we're going to drown out your voice, Imam. Uh, we're going to drown out the voice of Imam Abdullah. We're going to bring in more Zionist conspirators like Joe Sabag. Thank you so much for being with us today. Check us out again on the archives. Let's get to the six principles of Zionism. Thank you. Bye-bye. Well, that went fast. Yeah. <laughs>